I'd like now to open uh, Antoine's presentation for uh, for discussion uh, and whether there are questions from uh, the audience. Um, I'm looking at, uh, at, at the chat, so please, whenever you uh, wish to ask a question, go to the chat. Uh, I see some questions coming. Let, let me first ask you, um, Antoine, uh, would you say that the pandemic has now entered an endemic phase? That is, uh, you know, given the map that you've shown us in one of your first slides, since it's everywhere and since we have no ways of eradicating, are, are we dealing with a, a chronic endemic state? And in that situation, uh, what are the, um, the, the triggering factors of, of resurgence of, of uh, not outbreaks, but, but new waves that could have been, that, that have been identified? Uh, and is there a way to focus on 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 some of these specific factors, be them uh, density of the population or, of course, uh, lack of appropriate measures? Thank you, uh, Michel, for the for this question. And it is a very very difficult question. Uh, I could say, you know, we do not uh, uh, foresee beyond seven days, so. Uh, there is no endemic situation within seven days, <laughs> but only epidemic outbreaks and bursts. But uh, we could have some scenarios. First, uh, we can also answer to the question, what are the trigger factors? Because you have seen the four breaks. So if you lift any of these four breaks, you have a, a force for an outbreak and for a burst, uh, in the surge of cases. So. Uh, of course, uh, the seasonal break uh, was lifted uh, after the warm season in Europe, since, and it represents uh, the most important uh, factor for generating this outbreak in, in the fall. And the outbreak in the fall was not at the same force as the outbreak in March. The R, you know, the, the reproductive rate was not three, was uh, 1.5 below 1.5. So that was probably due to another break, which was the uh, protective measures, the masks, uh, wearing mandate masks in most countries in Europe, and also uh, the, the physical distance which, and, and hand washing, which play uh, an important role to reduce the R uh, that. So will it become endemic uh, after the vaccine? I don't know. What I can say is, you know, if the vaccine is administered to uh, high risk groups, particularly the vulnerable, the age, uh, elderly people, and also the at-risk people, may, it may transform dramatically the prognosis of the disease. And if you have a disease which is uh, for all the population, like in the green zone I mentioned below 50, it will become a very uh, common cold disease again. And maybe due to that, I mean, without any hospitalization, without any surge in intensive care units, in, without any death or almost no death due to the COVID-19, uh, it will become much more managed, even if it is chronic condition. Yeah, thank you very much. Important comment so that the stress, we, we, we should be able to develop the tools to prevent high mortality in, in high risk groups. And, 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 and have this disease no more uh, um, a threat, a, a public threat for uh, at, at serious level, but something that we can live uh, with. Uh, you know, related to this discussion, I see a question from uh, Stanislas Cozon. He's uh, saying, it seems that demography would be uh, a likely driver um, how close are we from being pretty sure that this is the case? Um, of course, demography is a, a key factor in terms of severity and in terms of, um, of mortality. Uh, so it, it's understandable that when you have a very young country, you have more protection against mortality and, and severe cases because of that. Um, 
what is not clear is if the young segment of the population uh, is a, a driver of the pandemic. It is possible that school and uh, school age children and, and students are a key driver of the pandemic in terms of spreading, not in terms of severity, not in terms of uh, surge in hospitals, but in terms of spreading within the community is highly probable that the young segment of the population are the driver of the of the pandemic. Thank you. I have uh, there are two questions around Africa. So maybe uh, Assi and and Juliette uh, Tuakili would like to ask their questions. Yes, us. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I mean, I'm trying to introduce you know, Africa by saying it's a gray zone. Well, we have to define what the gray zone is. And I heard, you know, a number of uh, factors, you know, that uh, seem to be playing a role there. And you mentioned demography with a question mark. You mentioned uh, cross-community with a question mark. You mentioned climate with a question mark. You mentioned even race and blackness you know, with a question mark. But I've not heard anything about what Africans are doing. You know, is it, shouldn't it be also considered that people are not just sitting and waiting for those factors, you know, to be determined and to protect it, but also people responded. There was action, you know, taken. And how much, you know, that action also has contributed to that. And that is not referred to one single time. You know, measures that are extremely difficult and powerful has been taken in very difficult context and under very difficult circumstances. You know, religious leaders closed mosques and churches. Markets, you know, were closed, you know, in economies where 80% of people rely on an informal sector, you know, to go for a daily living. And the curfews, you know, were imposed, you know, on people. You know, many measures which I think, if it happened in many countries in Europe, will then lead to a rebellion you know, or a kind of a uh, public to uh, live as we would say. But I think, you know, we cannot simply, you know, look at you know, Africa as a gray zone where there are a number of factors that may be contributing or not, you know, to the millions of deaths that we may or may not see. But I think it would be helpful to also understand what are the kind of accumulated experience in preparing for and responding to pandemics and epidemics over time and the measures that have been taken that may have contributed to that and can serve you know, for further action and incentive for Africa and for the rest of the world. And I'm missing that part every time we are talking about you know, the response. It is just a passive you know, kind of a waiting for protective factors and others. And I think we need to correct that. Over. Thank you. Thank you, As. And uh, of course, uh, Senegal is quite uh, an example uh, when when one talks about public uh, public action, maybe Antoine, before you answer, let's hear from uh, Juliette Tuakli that has also a question relating to to Africa. Juliette, yes, thank you. Um, looking at the slides, I totally agree with the previous speaker. By the way, um, but then that comes to the other issue of uh, climatic changes. Given what you've said. Would we therefore expect in the upcoming Harmattan season, which we're about ready to enter, um, an upsurge in our COVID uh, uh, incidents? Uh, because I think that would prove whether or not that in fact um, per uh, pertained to Africa as well as in the West, which alludes to my other concern. And that is, I think there are some social behaviors that we tend to ignore, smoking being one of them, much of the parts of Africa which have been spared are generally non-smoking. And those parts of the continent, despite their high GDP, despite their strong public health systems, tend to have a much higher proportion of people engaging in behaviors that compromise their respiratory systems. Thank you, uh, Antoine. Um, yes, thank you very much for, for these comments. I, I fully uh, share with you uh, uh, your, your comments, uh, uh, Mr. Asi, on, on the fact that the, the 
level of answers of response was huge, impactful, impactful in many other uh, aspects than the, the sanitary one. And um, it, it has to be taken into account. I will also uh, suggest or maybe suspect that there are some contributing uh, factors in Africa, uh, which is uh, uh, outdoor uh, life, which is probably uh, more important than in, in, uh, in European or northern countries. So uh, the fact that people are ventilating their rooms uh, at a higher pace also may contribute to, to help blocking the, the, the pandemic. Um, regarding the question of, uh, of uh, smokers, uh, uh, I will say it is controversial for the moment. Because, as you mentioned, definitely smoking alters the, the respiratory functions and should uh, play a, a, a negative role on COVID. Uh, I, but it, is, it has not been seen as a uh, risk factor, surprisingly. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, COPD. I'm not talking about the consequence of a chronic smoking habit which have deteriorated the uh, respiratory functions, which is a, a, a risk factor. But smoking uh, has been found as a protective factor for COVID-19, surprisingly, meaning that those in the series, uh, which has been uh, studied uh, in China, in Europe, or in the USA, uh, there are um, fewer smokers in COVID-19 uh, series and even in severe cases than uh, in the population. So it's something which uh, seems to be a bit strange that maybe nicotine could play a role uh, in protecting people. It has not been scientifically clearly demonstrated, although I know that there are some trials uh, we using uh, non um, uh, using um, uh, patch of nicotine or, or electronic cigarettes to see if there are an effect against uh, COVID-19. But so it's controversial, it's conflicting and not so clear that the fact that uh, low smoking in Africa could be protective. While we're talking about Africa, um, since we will move in the next uh, panel session to to global governance and, and global issues that are the core of this conference, Although, Antoine, you told us that you don't want to predict, you know, even in the midterm, what will be happening. Uh, it seems to me that there are fairly, let's call them stable, quote, stable patterns of the epidemic in different regions of the world. That is regional uh, patterns. Would you, would you agree with this? And if, uh, if so, do you think this should have implications for bringing a regional governance level to uh, to global governance of health uh, in addition to to the global solidarity and cooperation effort that is that is required oh it's um, yes it's so, so such a good question i, I really um, i would be very cautious regarding the the stable patterns for instance um, austria germany switzerland had expressed a very good response for the first wave in europe it was not so true for the second wave uh, austria and switzerland in particular uh, had uh, among the worst uh, uh, incidents in in uh, uh, in europe uh, Norway and Finland behaved as a champions in Europe, almost the same patterns as in Asia for the first wave. But now they are experiencing a surge, uh, a bit delayed from uh, the surge experienced in, in, in Southern Europe. So I don't know exactly how it will uh, go to. So uh, for the moment, it's true that Asia experienced a very, very good uh, uh, response uh, in terms of incidence and mortality. Uh, you, when you see that in Taiwan, 24 million people, there are seven deaths, accumulated deaths from the beginning of the pandemic when they are so close to the continent of China, you can see that they have a very, very good response. And Japan is not far. Uh, it's not completely sure that they will keep the pace 
or the whole pandemic. So it's a bit early. And when I say I don't want to predict too long, it's also with that. It's a bit early to be sure that they will not experience uh, uh, a surge. And for Africa, I so much hope that they will not have to face the trouble the Latin America countries or India uh, experienced uh, recently. Uh, but who can predict that it will not happen? Uh, fortunately, it may not happen, never. Uh, and maybe the vaccine will be uh, before anything can happen. But who can know? And I think uh, it's better to keep some protections uh, and some modesty also on, on these predictions. Thank you very much. I, I, I hope we return to this issue of regional global uh, later. There is a specific question from Alexandre de Germay on, on the spreaders. Alexandre, would you? Yeah, thank you, yeah. Uh, Michel. Uh, uh, Professor Flau, thanks for your interesting uh, uh, perspective. I had a question on the, uh, on the spreaders. Uh, do we have a way to better identify those spreaders? And do you know if we are running real world evidence study somewhere to actually narrow down some characteristic of those spreaders because it would of course allow us to focus our attention around the spreaders so that we don't uh, uh, stop or block uh, our overall society. Yes, thank you for, for your question. I think um, we should not have a too much romantic uh, um, view of these super spreaders. I mean, uh, the Japanese uh, approach, uh, you know, was a parsimonious approach initially. It was because of, of a shortage in testing that they decided to focus <laughs> on the super spreaders. And uh, their pragmatic approach mentioned that it is very hard to find the one, the super spreader. It is, and now they are more talking about super spreading events. So we can know that you attended to uh, a wedding party or to uh, a, a dinner in a restaurant, which was poor ventilated, or to um, uh, you know a, a core uh, in a church. And during this event, you have been contaminated, and some others also. And we are more focusing on the event rather than on the person. But sometimes it has been possible to identify these persons and they are like you and me. I mean, anyone can become a super spreader if he is contagious at a contagious phase of his disease, of his infection, sometimes before, his, and mostly before the symptoms of did occur, in the two days before, uh, highly contagious in a closed, poorly ventilated room which can be an abattoir, which can be a core, which can be a restaurant or a bar or an auditorium. So uh, that is more the environment where you are placed in, uh, I would say, uh, at the, the time where you were the most contagious, probably, that you were uh, tr triggering a super spreading event. Thank you. Um, I see... Uh... Two other questions from Stanislas Cozon and Michael van den Berg, but I think they they may uh, come better uh, at a later point in our discussion after we we hear from the from our panelists. So uh, thank you, Antoine, uh, for as I said, setting the scene.